Section 10 of Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Genoa. 16th October, 1644. We got to anchor under the Pharos, or Watchtower, built on a high rock at the mouth of the Mole of Genoa, the weather being still so foul that for two hours at least we durst not stand into the haven. Toward evening we adventured, and came on shore by the Pratique House, where, after strict examination by the syndics, we were had to the ducal palace, and there our names being taken, we were conducted to our inn, kept by one Zacharias, an Englishman. I shall never forget a story of our host Zachary, who, on the relation of our peril, told us of another of his own, being shipwrecked, as he affirmed solemnly, in the middle of a great sea somewhere in the West Indies, that he swam no less than twenty-two leagues to another island, with a tinder-box wrapped up in his hair, which was not so much as wet all the way, that picking up the carpenter's tools with other provisions in a chest, he and the carpenter, who accompanied him, good swimmers it seems both, floated the chest before them, and arriving at last in a place full of wood, they built another vessel, and so escaped. After this story we no more talked of our danger. Zachary put us quite down. 17th October 1644 Accompanied by a most courteous marshal called Thompson, we went to view the rarities. The city is built in the hollow or bosom of a mountain, whose ascent is very steep, high and rocky, so that from the lantern and mole to the hill it represents the shape of a theatre, the streets and buildings so ranged one above another as our seats are in the playhouses, but from their materials, beauty and structure never was an artificial scene more beautiful to the eye nor is any place for the size of it so full of well-designed and stately palaces as may be easily concluded by that rare book in a large folio which the great virtuoso and painter Paul Rubens has published, though it contains the description of only one street and two or three churches. The first palace we went to visit was that of Geronimo del Negros, to which we passed by boat across the harbour. Here I could not but observe the sudden and devilish passion of a seaman, who, plying us, was intercepted by another fellow that interposed his boat before him and took us in. For the tears gushing out of his eyes, he put his finger in his mouth and almost bit it off by the joint, showing it to his antagonist as an assurance to him of some bloody revenge if ever he came near that part of the harbour again. Indeed, this beautiful city is more stained with such horrid acts of revenge and murders than any one place in Europe, or haply in the world, where there is a political government which makes it unsafe to strangers. It is made a galley matter to carry a knife whose point is not broken off. This palace of Negros is richly furnished with the rarest pictures. On the terrace or hilly garden, there is a grove of stately trees, amongst which are sheep, shepherds and wild beasts, cut very artificially in a grey stone, fountains, rocks and fish ponds. Casting your eyes one way, you would imagine yourself in a wilderness and silent country, sideways in the heart of a great city, and backward in the midst of the sea. All this is within one acre of ground, in the house I noticed those red plaster floors which are made so hard and kept so polished that for some time one would take them for whole pieces of porphyry. I have frequently wondered that we never practised this art in England for cabinets and rooms of state, for it appears to me beyond any invention of that kind. But by their carefully covering them with, with canvas and fine mattresses where there is much passage, I suppose they are not lasting there in glory, and haply they are often repaired. 
there are numerous other palaces of particular curiosities, for the Marchand being very rich, have, like our neighbours the Hollanders, little or no extent of ground to employ their estates in. As those in pictures and hangings, so these laid out on marble houses and rich furniture. One of the greatest here for circuit is that of the Prince Doria, which reaches from the sea to the summit of the mountains. The house is most magnificently built without, nor less gloriously furnished within, having whole tables and bedsteads of massy silver, many of them set with agates, onyxes, cornelians, lazulus, pearls, turquoise, and other precious stones. The pictures and statues are innumerable. To this palace belong three gardens, the first whereof is beautified with a terrace supported by pillars of marble. There is a fountain of eagles and one of Neptune with other sea gods, all of the purest white marble. They stand in a most ample basin of the same stone. At the side of this garden is such an aviary as Sir Francis Bacon describes in his Sermodes Fidelium or Essays wherein grow trees of more than two feet diameter, besides cypress, myrtles, lenticuses, and other rare shrubs, which serve to nestle and perch all sorts of birds, who have air and place enough under their airy canopy, supported with huge iron work, stupendous for its fabric and the charge. The other two gardens are full of orange trees, citrons and pomegranates, fountains, grots and statues. One of the latter is a colossal Jupiter, under which is the sepulchre of a beloved dog, for the care of which one of this family received of the King of Spain five hundred crowns a year during the life of that faithful animal. The reservoir of water here is a most admirable piece of art, and so is the grotto over against it. We went hence to the palace of the dukes, where is also the court of justice, then to the merchant's walk, rarely covered. Near the ducal palace we saw the public armoury, which was almost all new, most neatly kept and ordered, sufficient for thirty thousand men. We were showed many rare inventions and engines of war peculiar to that armoury, as in the state when guns were first put in use. The garrison of the town chiefly consists of Germans and Corsicans. The famous Strada Nova, built wholly of polished marble, was designed by Rubens, and for stateliness of the buildings, paving, and eveningness of the street is far superior to any in Europe for the number of houses. That of Don Carlo Doria is a most magnificent structure. In the gardens of the old Marquis Spinola, I saw huge citrons hanging on the trees, applied like our apricots to the walls. The churches are no less splendid than the palaces. That of St. Francis is wholly built of Parian marble. St. Lawrence, in the middle of the city, of white and black polished stone, the inside wholly encrusted with marble and other precious materials. On the altar of St. John stand four sumptuous columns of porphyry, and here we were showed an emerald, supposed to be one of the largest in the world. The church of St. Ambrosio, belonging to the Jesuits, will, when finished, exceed all the rest, and that of the Annunciada, founded at the charges of one family, in the present and future design, can never be outdone for cost and art. From the churches we walked to the Mole, a work of solid huge stone, stretching itself near 600 paces into the main sea, and secures the harbour, heretofore of no safety. Of all the wonders of Italy, for the art and nature of the design, nothing parallels this. We pass over to the Pharos or Lantern, a tower of very great height. Here we took horses and made the circuit of the city as far as the new walls, built of a prodigious height and with Herculean industry. Witness those vast pieces of whole mountains which they have hewn away and blown up with gunpowder to render them steep and inaccessible. 
they are not much less than twenty English miles in extent, reaching beyond the utmost buildings of the city. From one of these promontories we could easily discern the island of Corsica, and from the same eastward we saw a vale having a great torrent running through a most desolate barren country, and then turning our eyes more northward saw those delicious villas of San Petro d'Arena which present another Genoa to you, the ravishing retirements of the Genoese nobility. Hence, with much pain, we descended towards the arsenal, where the galleys lie in excellent order. The inhabitants of the city are much affected to the Spanish mode and stately garb. From the narrowness of the streets, they use sedans and litters, and not coaches. 19th October 1644 We embarked in a felucca for Livorno or Leghorn, but the sea running very high we put in at Port Venere, which we made with peril between two narrow, horrid rocks, against which the sea dashed with great velocity. But we were soon delivered into as great a calm and a most ample harbour, being in the Gulf of Spezia. From hence we could see Pliny's Delphini Promontorium, now called Capo Fino. Here stood that famous city of Luna, whence the port was named Lunaris, being about two leagues over, more resembling a lake than a haven, but defended by castles and excessive high mountains. We landed at Larici, where being Sunday was a great procession, carrying the sacrament about the streets in solemn devotion. After dinner we took post-horses, passing through whole groves of olive trees, the way somewhat rugged and hilly at first, but afterward pleasant. Thus we passed through the towns of Zazana and Massa, and the vast marble quarries of Carrara, and lodged in an obscure inn at a place called Ferreggio. The next morning we arrived at Pisa, where I met my old friend Mr. Thomas Henshaw, who was then newly come out of Spain, and from whose company I never parted till more than a year after. The city of Pisa is as much worth seeing as any in Italy. It has contended with Rome, Florence, Sardinia, Sicily, and even Carthage. The palace and church of San Stefano, where the order of knighthood called by that name was instituted, drew first our curiosity the outside thereof being altogether of polished marble. Within, it is full of tables relating to this order, over which hang divers banners and pendants, with other trophies taken by them from the Turks, against whom they are particularly obliged to fight. Though a religious order, they are permitted to marry. At the front of the palace stands a fountain and the statue of the great Duke Cosmo. The Campanile, or Sette Zonio, built by John Venipon, a German, consists of several orders of pillars, thirty in a row, designed to be much higher. It stands alone on the right side of the cathedral, strangely remarkable for this, that the beholder would expect it to fall, being both exceedingly declining, by a rare address of the architect, and how it is supported from falling, I think would puzzle a good geometrician. The Duomo, or cathedral standing near it, is a superb structure, beautified with six columns of great antiquity. The gates are of brass, of admirable workmanship. The cemetery, called Campo Santo, is made of diverse galleys landing of earth, formerly brought from Jerusalem, said to be of such a nature as to consume dead bodies in forty hours. It is cloistered with marble arches, and here lies buried the learned Philip Decius, who taught in this university. At one side of this church stands an ample and well-wrought marble vessel, which heretofore contained the tribute paid yearly by the city to Caesar. It is placed, as I remember, on a pillar of opal stone, with diverse other antique urns. Near this, and in the same field, is the baptistry of San Giovanni, built of pure white marble, and covered with so artificial a cupola that the voice uttered under it seems to break out of a cloud. 
the font and pulpit supported by four lions, is of inestimable value for the preciousness of the materials. The place where these buildings stand they call the Aria. Hence we went to the college, to which joins a gallery so furnished with natural rarities, stones, minerals, shells, dried animals, skeletons, etc., as is hardly to be seen in Italy. To this the physic garden lies, where is a noble palm tree and very fine waterworks. The river Arno runs through the middle of this stately city, whence the main street is named Lungarno. It is so ample that the Duke's galleys, built in the arsenal here, are easily conveyed to Livorno. Over the river is an arch, the like of which, for its flatness and serving for a bridge, is nowhere in Europe. The Duke has a stately palace, before which is placed the statue of Ferdinand III. Over against it is the exchange, built of marble. Since this city came to be under the Dukes of Tuscany, it has been much depopulated, though there is hardly in Italy any which exceeds it for stately edifices. The situation of it is low and flat, but the inhabitants have spacious gardens and even fields within the walls. Livorno, 21st October 1644 we took coach to Livorno through the great duke's new park, full of huge cork trees, the underwood all myrtles, among which were many buffaloes feeding, a kind of wild ox, short nose with horns reversed. Those who work with them command them, as our bearwoods do the bears, with a ring through the nose and a corked. Much of this park, as well as a great part of the country about it, is very fenny, and the air very bad. Leghorn is the prime port belonging to all the Duke's territories, heretofore a very obscure town, but since Duke Ferdinand has strongly fortified it, after the modern way, drained the marshes by cutting a channel thence to Pisa, navigable sixteen miles, and has raised a mole, emulating that at Genoa, to secure the shipping, it has become a place of great receipt. It is also a place for the galleys, where they lie safe. Before the sea is an ample piazza for the market, where are the statues in copper of the four slaves, much exceeding the life for proportion, and in the judgment of most artists, one of the best pieces of modern work. Here, especially in this piazza, is such a concourse of slaves, Turks, Moors and other nations, that the number and confusion is prodigious, some buying, others selling, others drinking, others playing, some working, others sleeping, fighting, singing, weeping, all nearly naked and miserably chained. Here was a tent where any idle fellow might stake his liberty against a few crowns, at dice or other hazard, and if he lost, he was immediately chained and led away to the galleys, where he was to serve a term of years, but from whence they seldom returned. Many Scottish persons in a drunken bravado would try their fortune in this way. The houses of this neat town are very uniform, and excellently painted a fresco on the outer walls, with representations of many of their victories over the Turks. The houses, though low on account of the earthquakes which frequently happen here, as did one during my being in Italy, are very well built. The piazza is very fair and commodious, and with the church, whose four columns at the portico are of black marble polished, gave the first hint to the building both of the church and piazza in Covent Garden with us, though very imperfectly pursued. Florence 22nd October 1644 From Livorno I took coach to Empoli, where we lay, and the next day arrived at Florence, being recommended to the house of Signor Baritier in the Piazza del Spirito Santo, where we were exceedingly well treated. Florence is at the foot of the Apennines, the west part full of stately groves and pleasant meadows, beautified with more than a thousand houses and country palaces of note belonging to gentlemen of the town. 
the river Arno runs through the city in a broad but very shallow channel, dividing it, as it were, in the middle, and over it are four most sumptuous bridges of stone. On that nearest to our quarter are the four seasons in white marble, on another are the goldsmith's shops, at the head of the former stands a column of Ophite, upon which a statue of Justice, with her balance and sword, cut out of porphyry, and the more remarkable for being the first which had been carved out of that hard material, and brought to perfection, after the art had been utterly lost. They say this was done by hardening the tools in the juice of certain herbs. This statue was erected in that corner, because there Cosmo was first saluted with the news of Siena being taken. Near this is the famous Palazzo di Strozzi, a princely piece of architecture in a rustic manner. The Palace of Pitti was built by that family, but of late greatly beautified by Cosmo, with huge square stones of the Doric, Ionic and the Corinthian orders with a terrace at each side, having rustic, uncut balustrades, with a fountain that ends in a cascade seen from the great gate, and so forming a vista to the gardens. Nothing is more admirable than the vacant staircase, marbles, statues, urns, pictures, court, grotto and waterworks. In the quadrangle is a huge jet of water in a volto of four faces, with noble statues at each square, especially the Diana of Porphyry above the grotto. We were here shown a prodigious great lodestone. The garden has every variety, hills, dales, rocks, groves, aviaries, viveries, fountains, especially one of five jettos the middle basin being one of the longest stones I ever saw. Here is everything to make such a paradise delightful. In the garden I saw a rose grafted on an orange tree. There was much topiary work, and columns in architecture about the hedges. The Duke has added an ample laboratory, over against which stands a fort on a hill, where they told us his treasure is kept. In this palace the Duke ordinarily resides, living with his Swiss guards, after the frugal Italian way, and even selling what he can spare of his wines at the cellar under his very house, wicker baskets dangling over even the chief entrance into the palace, serving for a vintner's bush. In the church of Santo Spirito, the altar and reliquary are most rich and full of precious stones. There are four pillars of a kind of serpentine, and some of blue. Hence we went to another palace of the Duke's, called Palazzo Vecchio, before which is a statue of David by Michelangelo, and one of Hercules killing Cacus, the work of Bacchio Bandinelli. The quadrangle about this is of the Corinthian order, and in the hall are many rare marbles, as those of Leo X and Clement VII, both popes of the Medician family also the acts of Cosmo in rare painting. In the chapel is kept, as they would make one believe, the original Gospel of St John, written with his own hand, and the famous Florentine pandects and diverse precious stones. Near it is another pendant tower like that of Pisa, always threatening ruin. Under the Court of Justice is a stately arcade for men to walk in, and over that the shops of diverse rare artists who continually work for the great duke. Above this is that renowned Saimaliaka, or repository, wherein are hundreds of admirable antiquities, statues of marble and metal, vases of porphyry, etc. But among the statues none so famous as the Scipio, the boar, the idol of Apollo, brought from the Delphic temple, and true triumphant columns. Over these hang the pictures of the most famous persons and illustrious men in arts or arms, to the number of three hundred, taking out of the museum of Paulus Jovius. They then led us into a large square room, in the middle of which stood a cabinet of an octangular form, so adorned and furnished with crystals, agates and sculptures, as exceeds any description. This cabinet is called the Tribuna, and in it is a pearl as big as a hazelnut. The cabinet is of ebony, lazuli and jasper. Over the door is a round of Michelangelo. 
on the cabinet Leo X, with other paintings of Raphael, Del Sarto, Perugino and Correggio, viz. a St. John, a Virgin, a boy, two apostles, two heads of Jura, rarely carved. Over this cabinet is a globe of ivory, excellently carved. The labours of Hercules in massy silver and many incomparable pictures in small. There is another which had about it eight oriental columns of alabaster, on each whereof was placed a head of Caesar, covered with a canopy so richly set with precious stones that they resembled a firmament of stars. Within it was our Saviour's Passion and the Twelve Apostles in amber. This cabinet was valued at two hundred thousand crowns. In another, with chalcedon pillars, was a series of golden medals. Here is also another rich ebony cabinet, cupulated with a tortoise shell, and containing a collection of gold medals esteemed worth fifty thousand crowns. A wreathed pillar of oriental alabaster, diverse paintings of da Vinci, Pontorno, del Sarto, an Ecce Homo of Titian, a boy of Bronzini, etc. They showed us a branch of coral fixed on the rock, which they affirmed does still grow. In another room is kept the tabernacle appointed for the chapel of St. Lawrence, about which are placed small statues of saints of precious material. A piece of such art and cost, that having been these forty years in perfecting, it is one of the most curious things in the world. Here were diverse tables of Pietro Comesso, which is a marble ground inlaid with several sorts of marbles and stones of various colours, representing flowers, trees, beasts, birds and landscapes. In one is represented the town of Leghorn, by the same hand who inlaid the altar of St. Lawrence, Domenico Bonotti, of whom I purchased nineteen pieces of the same work for a cabinet. In a press near this they showed an iron nail, one half whereof, being converted into gold by one Tornhäuser, a German chemist, is looked on as a great rarity, but it plainly appeared to have been soldered together. There is a curious watch, a monstrous turquoise as big as an egg, on which is carved an emperor's head. In the armoury are kept many antique habits, as those of Chinese kings, the sword of Charlemagne, Hannibal's headpiece, a lodestone of a yard long, which bears up eighty-six pounds weight, in a chain of seventeen links, such as the slaves are tied to. In another room are such rare turneries in ivory as are not to be described for their curiosity. There is a fair pillar of oriental alabaster, twelve fast and complete services of silver plate and one of gold, all of excellent workmanship a rich embroidered saddle of pearls sent by the emperor to this duke, and here is that embroidered chair set with precious stones in which he sits when, on St John's Day, he receives the tribute of the cities. 25th October 1644 We went to the portico where the famous statue of Judith and Holofernes stands, also the Medusa, all of copper, but what is most admirable is the rape of a Sabine, with another man underfoot, the confusion and turning of whose limbs is most admirable. It is of one entire marble, the work of John de Bologna, and is most stupendous. This stands directly against the great piazza, where, to adorn one fountain, are erected four marble statues and eight of brass, representing Neptune and his family of sea gods, of a Colossian magnitude, with four sea horses in Parian marble of Lamedrati, in the midst of a very great basin, a work I think hardly to be paralleled. Here is also the famous statue of David by Michelangelo, Hercules and Carcass by Baccio Bandinelli, the Perseus in copper by Benevento, and the Judith of Donatelli, which stand publicly before the old palace with the centaur of Bologna, huge Colossian figures. Near this stand Cosmo de Medici is on horseback, in brass, on a pedestal of marble, and four copper basso relievos by John de Bologna, with diverse inscriptions. The Ferdinand I, on horseback, is a Pietro Tactica. 
the brazen boar which served for another public fountain, is admirable. After dinner we went to the church of the Annunziata, where the Duke and his court were at their devotions, being a place of extraordinary repute for sanctity. For here is a shrine that does great miracles, proved by innumerable votive tablets, etc., covering almost the walls of the whole church. This is the image of Gabriel, who saluted the Blessed Virgin, and which the artist finished so well that he was in despair of performing the Virgin's face so well, whereupon it was miraculously done for him while he slept. But others say it was painted by St Luke himself. Whoever it was, infinite is the devotion of both sexes to it. The altar is set off with four columns of oriental alabaster and lighted by thirty great silver lamps. There are innumerable other pictures by rare masters. Our Saviour's Passion in brass tables, inserted in marble, is the work of John de Bologna and Baccio Bandinelli. To this church joins a convent whose cloister is painted in fresco very rarely. There is also near it a hospital for one thousand persons with nurse children and several other charitable accommodations. At the Duke's Kaleveritsa, the Prince has a stable of the finest horses of all countries, Arabs, Turks, Barbs, Genets, English, etc., which are continually exercised in the manege. Near this is a place where are kept several wild beasts, as wolves, cats, bears, tigers and lions. They are loose in a deep-walled court, and therefore to be seen with more pleasure than those at the Tower of London, in their grates. One of the lions leapt to a surprising height to catch a joint of mutton which I caused to be hung down. End of section 10